Ladies and gentlemen, it seems like Ukraine's counteroffensive has started at last. But is this the whole picture or is this just another deception? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's May 12th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. But first, of course, I wanted to announce that I am launching a newsletter. That's right. If you want the most relevant national security stories, not just on Ukraine, but in the whole world, sent right to your inbox, distilled in a no-nonsense, military, clean, no extraneous anything format, the Strategic Set Rep is for you. We haven't even launched yet. This is like the alpha. So if you go to the link in the description, sign up. It's free and it's going to be a weekly email giving you everything you need to know about the national security space and nothing that you don't. So check the link in the description. But here's the thing. Here's what you guys are really here for. That is the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now let's take a look back it up to about the 7th. You can see here that again, Russian forces imminently in danger of taking Bakhmut. And you can see that Ukrainian forces begin again at a fairly low value, looks like a localized counterattack on uh, between the 7th and the 10th, pushing Russian forces back to this tree line here, right? It, it, it looks like a shaping operation, right? But as you can see, as we advance the 11th, uh, suddenly between the 10th and 11th, what looked like a localized um, operation actually turned out to be a multi-front uh uh, counter attack. Now, you can see here, right, the first priority is seems to be freeing up the two routes into and out of Bakhmut, right? This have been under considerable pressure for months. They've taken to calling it the road of life uh, because it represents the only route out of Bakhmut. Um, and it's been under pretty much continuous Russian fire. So this salient here that they've created is giving breathing room to this second route and almost undoubtedly they're also going to be pushing along this route here as russian forces advance um, but you can see here to the south as well ukrainian forces pushing the russians back behind this rail line and roadway um, and this is reflective exactly of how you would want to do a uh a, a pressure relieving counter attack. Now you can see here again, Russian forces begin to realize they are in danger of encirclement for the first time in a while. And it seems like they are beginning their withdrawal process, right? As more and more of this territory uh, flips to Ukrainian control. Now I will say, uh, I called it, uh, I'd been talking for weeks how there is a lot of strategic value in uh, initially launching this counteroffensive in the Bakhmut area. Why? Because Bakhmut is where Russia's elite VDV and, um, oh, you can also see, sorry, almost missed this on the Northern flank. They're also pushing back against Russian VDV, right? Creating a contested region in this Northern flank as well. Now you may be like, Paul, why aren't they pushing in Bakhmut itself? And the answer is because likely this is a maneuver warfare, uh, operation. Uh, tanks moving quickly across open terrain. You can see how this terrain is very open with very limited um, forested areas. Um, and this favors uh, what you can, you know, what in civilian terms we would call tank warfare. Um, it's, it's terrain that tanks can move on. Um, we call it mechanized or maneuver warfare um, in, in military doctrine. But Bakhmut, because it's dense, it's urban. I mean, imagine driving a tank through the city streets of Bakhmut. Would you feel safe with all those high-rise buildings surrounding you? Of course not. You'd feel like a sitting duck, right? But when you're in open terrain with a big expansive field of view, you have lots of tanks side by side, it's a way different fight. Um, it's a way more favorable fight to the armored forces. And Ukraine doesn't have to take Bakhmut block by block. If they can surround and cut off the city, then the Russian forces will be forced to withdraw or become encircled. And so that is the uh, way to speed run liberating a place like Bakhmut. Now, why 
why choose this place? Well, as I've been saying for a while, this is where Russia's elite troops are. Their Wagner Group, their VDV. And if you're going to have to fight these troops eventually, then you might as well fight them when you are in your best state, when you have all your equipment, when you have all your best trained troops, right? What you wouldn't want to do is fight Russia's best troops after having your offensive force attrited through days or weeks of high intensity combat. And so the other reason is because these forces have been on an offensive posture. This is actually the only region where Russia has not pivoted fully to the defense. In places like Zaporizhia province, for example, Russian forces have been digging extensive trench networks, sometimes 12 or 15 miles deep um, into the region because it was deemed so, it was the book answer to this counteroffensive. And so Russian forces are dug in and it would be tough to advance in all these areas. The only place where they weren't is Bakhmut. So that's what I think we're seeing here. Now, this is what I will say. Uh, first off, we'll look at the combat map. You guys can see Russian forces. Again, limited, limited offensive actions being conducted. Uh, Marinka, uh, a little bit in Avdivka, and again, continuing to launch very limited attacks in Bakhmut proper, as well as some efforts to counterattack um, here in the southern prong near Chasov Yar. But I, but this is exactly what I talked about. In every other line of the front, these forces are not focused on offensive operations. They are on a defensive posture and have been for a long time. So again, there is a logic to this. Now, here's what I'll say. 13 brigades, that's the size of this offensive. That is a lot of personnel. It's so many, in fact, that even launching this two-pronged attack in Bakhmut still probably doesn't maximize the use of those brigades. It's it's sort of like imagine if you had to get it's like it's like the a, a huge stadium after a big sporting event, right? Everybody gets in their cars and everybody tries to leave and always there's lines and lines of traffic as people try to get onto the on-ramp. Now, that's the sort of issue you run into when you try to move 13 brigades um, in relatively small areas, even in like one front like this. So I suspect that this may actually prove to be um, either one axis of advance for the counteroffensive. It may still turn out to be a shaping operation, though a very extensive one. Um, but I suspect that we will see Ukraine force Russia to make harder and harder choices. Right now, probably based on the fact that Prigozhin has has stated publicly that Russian lines have been broken in this region, that I think you're going to see Russia commit its reserve forces or pull forces from other areas of the front lines to stabilize this um, break in Bakhmut. But if they do so, that where they draw those forces from, I suspect, will help dictate where else Ukraine may consider launching the other portions of its counteroffensive effort. Again, if you're smart, they should be sort of mutually supporting. So a good example may actually be Avdivka. Um, it may be Volodar. Uh, it, it may even be along Kremina Lyman uh, to the north or towards Lesachansk. There's a lot of options available to them, but I think they're going to have to find the sweet spot between what's called concentration of, um, well, concentration is the principle that says that you put your firepower, right? You sort of take your firepower and you turn it into a spear so that there is a decisive thrust. There's a point at which your combat power is so laser focused that it can't be resisted. And you have to trade that against economy of force, right? Which is not using so many troops that it becomes, but they no longer provide um, mission effectiveness, right? And so you have to look and say, what is the perfect value that allows us to be a strong spear breaking Russian lines and exploiting that breakthrough without necessarily being, again, the you know, 40,000th car trying to leave Dodgers stadium or whatever. Uh, and this is, again, this is the, this is why having 
extensive planning at both the Ukrainian level, but also that planning assistance from the U.S. is really valuable, right? We say, oh, moving 13 brigades is is, is a lot, um, and it is. Don't get it twisted. 65,000 troops is a ton, um, but the U.S. has routinely done these operations. Um, it, did, it moved 300,000 in the initial Iraq invasion. Um, it has been cycling... Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops in and out of countries uh, for 20 years. So being able to plan logistics and movement is something that the U.S. is definitely provided Ukraine a lot of technical assistance on. I'm I'm certain of it. Um, so that's the big question is where else, right, is what at least I ask myself when I look at this. Um, but anyway, guys, that's the news. Certainly huge news. And be sure, again, the link is in the description. It's a pinned comment. Sign up for free to the Strategic SITREP. Get the news you need to understand the str strategic situation across the globe. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next one.